Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kevin Rigby, and I'm proud again to be the Master of Ceremonies for the 27th Annual Alliance for Aging Research Bipartisan Congressional Awards Celebration. Now, I miss seeing all of you in person, but I can tell you this, this program and the award recipients are going to be simply outstanding. As you know, the Alliance for Aging Research is the leading national nonprofit focused on accelerating advances in healthy aging. The Alliance has hosted the annual Bipartisan Congressional Award Celebration for 27 years to recognize heroes in health. In other words, its partners who have shown unmatched commitment to advancing science, policies, and awareness that help people live longer and healthier lives. But before we kickstart this program off, I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. Your support for the Alliance for Aging Research and our mission is always appreciated, but now more than ever, the coronavirus has disproportionately impacted older adults and they need our help now. By joining us today, you are helping the Alliance provide us support for older Americans. Now I have to ask you, how many of you are suffering from Zoom fatigue? I know I am, but recognizing this, we have tailored the program to really focus on and to celebrate our heroes in health who've done so much for our older friends and family members. This year, we have some new and very special awards to give out. You're gonna learn more about these awards and the incredibly talented honorees soon. But first, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you on behalf of the Alliance for Aging Research for helping to make 2020 another record year for fundraising for this event. So thank you ever so much. But thank you also for recognizing the need for the Alliance's mission to help older Americans live healthier and better lives, especially nowadays in the midst of the pandemic. We know we have a while to go before we beat COVID-19, so your continued support is important. Please go to agingresearch.org slash give to make a tax deductible donation and help fuel the Alliance's work on behalf of older Americans. Well, now it is truly my pleasure to introduce to you the president and CEO for the Alliance for Aging Research, Sue Peshin. Hi everyone, and welcome to our 2020 Heroes in Health, an event to celebrate community, strength, and healthy aging. We hope all of you have stayed safe and well. If you or those you care about have recently experienced sickness, isolation, or loss, whether from COVID-19 or something else, our thoughts are with you. Every year, we at the Alliance strive to elevate those who champion research and healthy aging, but this year, the ritual of coming together to recognize heroes in health is more important than ever. So thank you for joining us virtually this year. I wish I could see all of you in person looking dressed up and fabulous, at the U.S. Institute of Peace as we had originally planned, but I look forward to the day when we will gather again. While this year's celebration has changed in so many ways, I personally like how some things can still stay the same. We thank Kevin Rigby for moving online with us to be our Heroes in Health tour guide. We couldn't imagine doing this without you. Our annual sizzle wheel features the important health education and public policy work my colleagues do, and it's available on our virtual event page and in the virtual exhibit hall. Thanks to Janelle Germanos on our team for putting it together. I have an important list of thank yous, so please stay with me while I acknowledge everyone. We thank our Heroes in Health Chair and Board of Directors Chair, Jim Scott, and our Heroes in Health Committee for their fantastic input in helping us reshape this year's event into a virtual experience. On behalf of the staff, we truly appreciate the extra encouragement from our board of directors this year and our shared commitment to social justice. Collectively, we believe that everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity, should be able to experience healthy aging. This evening would simply not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Our award underwriters include Amgen, the Claude Pepper Foundation, which sponsors the Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging, Eli Lilly for the Distinguished Public Service Award, AbvaMed, supporter of the Silver Innovator Award, and Johnson & Johnson, supporter of our Perennial Hero Award. Our media sponsor, Berman & Company. Our silver sponsors include Acadia, Applied Policy, Biogen, and Pharma. Our bronze sponsors are AbbVie, Lumbeck, Otska, and Takeda. 
Additionally, we thank our fabulous FDA and CMS Roundtable sponsors, Abbott, GSK, and United Health Group. Our Roundtable supporters, Bio, Edwards Life Sciences, Merck, and Omnicom Group, and our Roundtable innovators, Better Medicare Alliance, BioFitus, Bright Focus Foundation, Consumer Healthcare Products Association, Healthy Women, National Pharmaceutical Council, Pfizer, the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, U.S. Pharmacopeia, and Women Heart. Thank you to our friends at Aiken Gum for their incredibly generous support of the Alliance. We have been a pro bono client of Aiken Gum for a number of years. Their counsel and care are the best around, and we cannot thank them enough. I also want to thank King and Spalding for embarking with us on the journey we've started together to ban the quali. More on that important issue and project a little later. I've been listening recently to the author and speaker, Simon Sinek, and he teaches that leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. The people in my charge at the Alliance mean the world to me, and I'm in awe at how they've shown up these last six months for their families, for work, and for each other. So to my awesome colleagues, thank you in particular for pivoting together and for looking for ways that we can help during this crisis. For those of you who may be with us for the first time, you may not know that we're deliberate in choosing our event themes for the year. For 2020, we chose community, strength, and healthy aging, and I'm going to take a few minutes to explain why. The pandemic has challenged us in so many ways, but I think one of the broadest and most significant is how we view each other in our communities. I had the professional opportunity to travel to three places between December 26th and February 22nd that individually seemed like coincidences, but together created a synchronicity. I visited China, Minneapolis, and New York, three places that experienced levels of hardship and loss in the ensuing months like no one could have ever imagined, but also three places that welcomed me and my colleagues into their extraordinary communities. I kicked off 2020 in China at the invitation of Dr. Jin Ha Lee, CEO at U.S. Green Valley Pharmaceuticals. I met Dr. Lee when he spoke at our annual ACT-AD meeting. ACT-AD is our Accelerate Cure and Treatments for All Dementias Coalition. Soon after Dr. Lee presented at our meeting, he invited me to speak at the global launch of their clinical trial effort in Beijing. While there, my husband Stephen and I spent time with Dr. Lee and his incredibly kind colleagues who have a passion for helping families facing Alzheimer's disease. When we left on January 1st, 2020, we felt we had met some very special people that we are glad to call partners and friends. In early February, my colleagues and I flew to Minneapolis to attend Rock from the Heart, a weekend of events designed to connect survivors, caregivers, medical professionals, researchers, and others affected by aortic disease. We were there for an early celebration of the Alliance-led Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day, and my colleague, Lindsay Clark, gave a terrific plenary at their educational symposium. We also participated in a VIP reception and concert featuring infamous 80s band Night Ranger and the band that fell to the earth with Rock from the Heart co-founder and aortic disease survivor Pete Johnson on the drums. Our flagship event for Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day was with the Harlem Chamber of Commerce and the Association of Black Cardiologists in New York on February 22nd. Healthcare professionals from Harlem Hospital and Mount Sinai provided free screenings, and we did a really fun Facebook Live discussion with Dr. John White, WebMD's Chief Medical Officer. Our community is also apparent in our collaborations. I think most of you know the Alliance is made up of less than a dozen people. We're small but mighty, I like. I'd like to declare, the Mighty is really all about the incredible people that are in our community, on our board, at the companies, federal agencies, research centers, foundations, healthcare offices, and payers that we get to work with, and our partners at a super long list of amazing organizations. We have also learned from our international partners through organizations like the World Economic Forum. It's powerful stuff when we join together with all of you to push for change. One such example is teaming up with the Partnership to Improve Patient Care, known by many as PIPSI, to co-chair the Friends of the Cori reauthorization. This effort brought together 200 powerhouse organizations that successfully secured the 10-year reauthorization and full funding of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, and working with the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, 
and other incredibly impressive organizations to create Project PAUSE, which stands for Psychoactive Appropriate Use for Safety and Effectiveness. We're working together to advocate on issues in long-term care for people with neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. These are tough, stigma-filled issues, and these groups are super smart, compassionate, and fierce. There's also the Heart Valve Disease Policy Task Force, where we work with leading minority health and heart valve disease patient groups to advocate for broader Medicare coverage of less invasive technology for heart valve repair. And there's Project LOOP, which stands for Lowering Out-of-Pocket Costs. We started Project LOOP to bring together aging and patient advocacy groups in support of an out-of-pocket cap in Medicare Part D and other policies to allow beneficiaries to smooth costs out through the benefit year. Our theme throughout these projects is that everyone has stories, but the gulf that exists between us as people is superficial. When we look at each other, we can't see the stories. But once we hear each other's stories, we so often realize that the things we see as dividing us are all too often based on illusions and falsehoods. We see that the walls between us are in truth no thicker than the scenery. A community mindset teaches us that we all deserve to not only live, but to do so with dignity and respect. It's why we at the Alliance know it's inter integral to our mission to denounce racism, acknowledge that Black Lives Matter, and turn our words into more focused actions. It's why we know that it's offensive and wrong to say things like COVID-19 are caused by a specific country or group of people. And it's also why we believe that when the world is experiencing a crisis, we need to act as if we are part of the global community and do all we can to collaborate, solve problems, and help others. Developing a community mindset widens our view teaches us to listen to each other, and reminds us to empathize. Our second theme for this year is strength. Before the pandemic started, our reason for choosing strength as a theme was to call attention to an important age-related condition called sarcopenia that causes muscle loss. Through our Aging in Motion effort, we'll release an educational film about it later this year. Strength, of course, also refers to our ability to psychologically adapt and cope. If it's possible to identify a good thing about this time, I think it's that we're rediscovering one another. During these months, it's all of us, fragile, suffering, vulnerable humans, trying to hold it together for ourselves and for others with sometimes frightening moments, and in a way the pretenses of the normal world that we put up with and suffer from have kind of gone. We're all much stronger than we think. We're in the middle of a crisis, and broadly speaking, most of us are just about coping. And even if we're not coping, not coping is okay. So this crisis is making us stronger by revealing to us that we don't have to be perfect. This is, this is not perfect at all, and these are not perfect days, and still we're marshalling strength in the uncertainty of it all. Healthy aging, our final theme that anchors what we do at the Alliance, encompasses many things. What this year has shined a spotlight on is that none of us can do impactful work in aging and health without recognizing and addressing the disparities that exist within it. One overlooked aspect of systemic discrimination in healthcare lies within health economics. Many countries make drug reimbursement and coverage decisions based on cost effectiveness assessments. The effectiveness of a treatment is often determined by a metric known as the Quality Adjusted Life Year, or QALI for short. Quality assessments assign a financial value to patients in relation to an intended treatment. When applied to healthcare decision making, the results mean that some patients, people with disabilities, veterans, and older adults, are often deemed too expensive to receive the care that's being evaluated. Qualies are also not able to account for health disparities, which hurts people of color and low income communities. This played out in a recent report by the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, known as ICER for short, on treatments for sickle cell disease, which primarily imp impacts black people. The real life application of adopting this methodology is that most, in most insurance companies don't cover new treatments for sickle cell disease easily or at all. Now I know talking about health economics is boring, most discussions about infrastructure are boring, but infrastructures are created by people and therefore reflect the values of the people who create them. They often do not work equally well for each of us. 
we think it's time to disrupt the infrastructure of health economics to make it fair. The Alliance is committed to advocating for Congress to enact a universal quality ban for coverage and reimbursement decision making. The law firm King & Spalding will be helping us to do this pro bono, and we're gonna be reaching out to our community to stand with us. We also look to leading health economists to develop non-quality alternatives that put the economic focus strictly on the effectiveness of treatments and services and whether they're truly delivering health outcomes that patients want. This would be an impactful change to healthcare and we hope you'll join us. I think that what we most need to take away from this crisis is we can change things. And we can change things not over 10 years, but over an afternoon. We can radically change how we live and be imaginative and courageous as we do it. We can try to make life the more fulfilling, decent, and genuinely kind thing that we know in our hearts we all want, but so often we're, we feel held back. Let's throw the bad traditions out of the window and try to be ambitious about how we want to live. On behalf of the Alliance for Aging Research, thank you again for tuning in to our virtual Heroes in Health. We're honored to have you join us for this important celebration, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's program. Thank you, Sue, for that impressive update and all that you do on behalf of the Alliance for Aging Research. Our first award presenter is the Alliance's good friend, Tom Spulak, Chairman and President of the Claude Pepper Foundation, who is here today to present the Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging. Tom will tell us more about this important award named for the Honorable Claude Pepper, who fought tirelessly in both the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives to help those in need, including our nation's elderly. In his day job, Tom is partner in the law firm of King & Spaulding and chairs its government and public policy practice group in Washington, D.C. Before entering private practice, Tom served as staff director and general counsel of the House Committee on Rules, as well as general counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives. But we've come to know Tom, and we know that's only half the story about Tom. These are just some of the credentials he shares with us, but all of us want to know about who he is. And I can tell you this, Tom devotes a considerable amount of time in the service of nonprofit organizations. In addition to serving as chairman and president of the Claude Pepper Foundation, he's also chairman of the Hospice Foundation of America and board member of Close Up Foundation. Tom and the Claude Pepper Foundation have been incredible friends to the Alliance, and the foundation is once again supporting this year's Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging. So please, all of us, welcome Tom to the podium. Welcome. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Alliance for Aging Research's Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging. The Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging was established to honor a Democratic member of Congress who was leading the way for policies encouraging medical research, innovation, and care to benefit Americans as they grow older. Supported by the Claude Pepper Foundation, this award is named for the Honorable Claude Pepper, who fought tirelessly in both the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives to help those in need. As chair of the House Select Committee on Aging, he sought to strengthen programs for older adult and disabled Americans, including Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Through the Claude Pepper Foundation, the Pepper Institute, and Pepper Centers at Florida State University, the Congressman's legacy lives on and is dedicated to research on aging and alternatives to long-term care. This year's recipient of the Claude Pepper Award is House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Frank Pallone, Jr. Chairman Pallone has been advocating for older Americans' health and financial security for more than 35 years since his days in the New Jersey State Senate. Chairman Pallone has led the way for some of the most significant improvements in the Medicare and Medicaid programs and championed research at the National Institute of Health and clinical developments at the FDA all of which the Alliance for Aging has been honored to help support. The Affordable Care Act has done so much for Americans by launching free preventive care for older adults, closing the Part D coverage gap, and introducing coordinated care to improve healthy aging. Chairman Pallone has led the efforts in the House to defend and strengthen this landmark law. 
His 21st Century Cures Act increased funding for NIH and helped accelerate patient-centered medical product development at the FDA. He has also guided reauthorization of the FDA user fee program, which has become increasingly vital to the FDA's ability to accomplish its mission of bringing safe and effective medical products to older adults and Americans. Chairman Pallone, it is an honor to be with you and to present with you the Claude Pepper Award for Advancing Healthy Aging. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And I think you can see the award here. It's very pretty, a green and blue. Um, my, uh, throughout my career, I've kind of used the green and the blue in our campaigns uh, because green is, uh, you know, was the color of uh, so many things here at the Jersey Shore and, of course, the ocean with the blue. So it's really nice. It's a very pretty award, and I thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to say, too, that well, you know, of course, I knew you, Tom, as the uh, staff director for the Rules Committee because Claude Pepper was the chairman of the Rules Committee for so many years. But at the same time, as you know, he was the chair of the uh, Select Committee on Aging. And when I um, first decided to run for Congress in 1988, um, he was still, I think it was his last year. And uh, I remember going to the Atlanta Convention and looking for him because I chaired the Aging Committee in the State Senate. Um, and I wanted to get his support, and he was great. We, we met. I had uh, some time to spend with him. Um, I don't know. I, I think he may have even written me a check, actually. <laughs> um, but in any case, he was very supportive. And then when I uh, went to Congress the next year, I think it was Lucille Roybal Allard's fa father who was his successor. And right. I approached him, and, and then Claude Pepper asked him to put me on the aging committee. And so I was on the, that committee as well. Well, that's wonderful. So now's the time when I ask you a few questions. You know, you mentioned earlier about Claude Pepper being chairman of the Aging Committee and, and, and uh, your being chairman of the Aging Committee. When he started, uh, he was already in his 80s when he was chairman of the Aging Committee. But uh, although you are still a relatively young man, uh, <laughs> when you started, you were a baby compared to Claude Pepper. So what got you interested in wanting to uh, work on, on aging issues uh, back in the New Jersey Senate? Well, I had an, a large number of seniors in my district, still do, of course. Um, and um, so there was that factor. I mean, there was a political factor because I wanted to get reelected. But also, um, when, I was, um, when I graduated from law school, I worked uh, part-time uh, for a, 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 an agency called Protective Services for the Elderly. And it was basically a nonprofit um, that provided uh, what would you call like a guardianship and conservatorship uh, mm -hmm. services. The, it, you know, there still is, and, and it was basically responding mostly to financial abuse, like where a senior citizen, either by a friend or a family member, was being financially abused, you know, taking their money, whatever. And so, um, and so I, th that agency uh, had a, had a part-time lawyer, that was me, uh, and we would, uh, you know, try to protect seniors from that kind of fraud and abuse. And then sometimes I would have to go in and, and have an, a conservator appointed for their finances or a guardian for, you know, dependent on the situation. And, um, and then when I was elected to the state Senate, it was interesting. I was like the it, it, but for me, the Democrats wouldn't have had a majority. Like we had a majority of one or two. I don't remember exactly. And I was 35. It was a minimum age. You had, oh, maybe 30. I think you had to be 30 in order to be a senator, right? That was an age thing. Yeah. So I was the youngest. Uh, but they were, the leadership in the state senate, the Democratic leadership was very concerned about my seat. And they knew there were a lot of seniors. So I asked, well, could I chair the aging committee? And they said, yes. And then what we did is we passed a bill that essentially set up a public guardian very similar to what I did right. before statewide that was a state function. Uh, you know, that was a bill. We also did a bill on Alzheimer's daycare to provide for that. And we also did a bill on, um, uh, on uh, the continuing care retirement communities. You call them lifetime communities where you buy into it and you get like personal attendant, you know, you get your, your housing but you also get personal attendant. And then if you need the nursing home care, there's that element. And, and we did a bill regulating that because it was a lot of financial abuse with those systems initially. They were not well financed and they went bankrupt. 
So there's, you know, I was very interested in all those issues when I met Claude Pepper. Well, that's great. Well, listen, uh, as we wrap up, let me ask you this question. As you approach aging, because you look fantastic and you... <laughs> well, it's very deceiving. <laughs> you know, and I know that you have an extremely active schedule, uh, both in D.C. and, of course, back home. Um, but you know, what does healthy aging mean to you? Uh, uh, how, how, you know, how would one sort of prepare as they think about going into sort of that stage of their lives? Well, I'm not a very good example because I'm not, you know, very active physically, unfortunately. But I mean, you know, it obviously, you know, things like being active physically, bicycling, walking, uh, you know, where I live is right near the ocean. So you see all kinds of people my age or older, you know, walking on the boardwalk, bicycling to try to keep fit. But I, I, I'm not. But what, one of the things that I did do, though, a couple of years ago, because uh, I'm 68 now, uh, and I became conscious of it when I turned 65, right, was to, to try to, to trim down. In other words, I, I've lost maybe over, maybe like 20 pounds or so over the last year or two. It was a pretty gradual thing. So, you know, those are the most important things, I think. But it's also to, to be active. Now, of course, being on, in Congress is not, maybe you shouldn't even be asking me this question, Tom, because, you know, being in Congress is incredibly stressful, particularly now during COVID. So I don't know if I'm a very good example. But I mean, it's obviously you have to stay active, you know, uh, physically, mentally, uh, otherwise, and be involved in the community. I think all those things are very important. Well, that's excellent. That's excellent. Well, Mr. Chairman, thanks so much. And congratulations on this much deserved uh, award. We wish you continued success in your representation of New Jersey's 6th Congressional District, and of course, your work to better the health and well-being of Americans. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you for this wonderful award. You deserve it. Here to present the Alliance's Distinguished Public Service Award is Sean O'Neill, Vice President of Government Affairs for Eli Lilly and Company. I've known Sean and worked with Sean for many years, and I can tell you that he is an outstanding leader in government affairs and a true advocate on behalf of patients. Sean has deep experience in the executive branch of the federal government and patient advocacy. Prior to joining Lilly, Sean ran the federal government affairs operation at Novartis Pharmaceuticals, where he was responsible for directing and implementing legislative and regulatory strategies. In his position at Lilly, Sean serves as the head of Lilly's government affairs, including federal, state, alliance, and PAC activities. We want to thank Eli Lilly and Company for support of the Distinguished Public Service Award. And now, Sean, you're up. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean O'Neill with Eli Lilly, and I'm happy to present the 2020 Alliance for Aging Research Distinguished Public Service Award. The award is given each year to a Republican member of Congress who is leading the way on policies encouraging medical research, innovation, and care to benefit Americans as they grow older. This year's award honors Congressman Gus Villarakis, who has represented Florida in Congress since 2007. Through his leadership on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Villarakis has been an advocate for disease research and care issues that disproportionately impact older adults. He serves as an active co-chair on the House Congressional Caucus on Parkinson's Disease and has spoke personally about his family's experience with PD when the Alliance released the Silver Book, Parkinson's Disease, with the Michael J. Fox Foundations for Parkinson's Research. Over his career, Congressman Bill Arrakis has worked to improve mental health and community care for our nation's veterans. He has sponsored legislation to require Medicare to cover hearing aids for older adults, ease the process for older adults transitioning into Medicare, and co-introduced legislation to help coordinate state, local, and federal agencies' efforts that provide older adults with streamlined testing and care during the pandemic. Recently, Congressman Bill Arrakis introduced legislation to allow Medicare and Medicaid to reimburse for behavioral health services delivered via telehealth. The legislation seeks to address mental health provider shortages, which in some parts of the country delay patients from seeing psychiatrists for months. He is also supported bipartisan legislation to increase the ability of nursing homes to utilize telehealth for virtual visits for residents unable to see their friends and loved ones during the pandemic. Most recently, he's also advocated to increase awareness and reduce the stigma associated with COVID-19, always in support of what the science says 
Congressman Bill Arrakis, it's wonderful to be here with you today and present the Distinguished Public Service Award to you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that very much. Uh, I do have some prepared remarks as well. Our seniors do really represent the greatest generation, that's for sure. And I believe we owe it to them to do all we can to empower them to live life to the fullest while providing a safety net for those who may need additional help. First and foremost, I believe we must help our seniors during this pandemic. We wanna make sure that each state is following the CDC and CMS guidelines for keeping vulnerable populations, particularly those in long-term care facilities safe. And I think we've done a good job here in the state of Florida. I've co-authored the Protecting the Health of America's Older Adults During COVID and Beyond Act, which will fill the gaps by fostering collaboration among sectors, including the identification and dissemination of evidence-based practices to assess the most vulnerable older adults, limit exposure of adult, uh, older adults and their caregivers to the COVID-19, of course, and better care for older adults who are infected. Additionally, the Health Healthy Aging Grant Program through the CDC created in this bill would support local and state public health departments to promote older adult health and well-being, so very important, as well as provide resources to this vulnerable community. Additionally, I've supported massive increases to the Meals on Wheels program to make sure more seniors have access to nutritional meals uh, throughout the pandemic. We've also closed the donut hall, which was an important step to help seniors. We must also work to ensure the long-term sustainability of Medicare and Social Security. We also must protect against scamming behaviors. Last year, we passed the, tra we passed the TRACED Act, which has reduced robocalls by 60% in the past six months. Congratulations again. Thank I you. would like to ask you a few questions uh, on sure. the work you're being recognized for. And I think you started to touch on some of these, but given your leadership on promoting policies that encourage medical research, innovation, and care to uh, benefit Americans as they, as they grow older, what are some of the most pressing issues you see now for older adults? Well, uh, first of all, you know, the COVID-19, obviously, uh, and the, the, the isolation issue. Uh, and that's why it's important that uh, they have access to, to mental health uh, treatment. I, I'm concerned, uh, you know, when an elderly patient uh, has Alzheimer's or, for example, Parkinson's, uh, you know, the caregivers. Uh, you get caregivers, and, and even if you have long-term care insurance, it doesn't cover everything, uh, and, and that's so important. There are a lot of issues facing our elderly, and I, that's why I wanted to, I want to have this, uh, this separate select committee in the House like we did. My, my father, who served for many years in Congress, uh, was part of that select com committee early on. You know, you talked, about, you talked a little bit about your your efforts to allow Medicare and Medicaid to reimburse for yeah. behavioral health services through telehealth or in remotely. Why is this such an important issue for healthy aging in your mind? They need to get access. And a lot of times they may feel more comfortable at home. And, and a lot of times they can be seen frequently, uh, more frequently anyway, uh, at home. Uh, and and sometimes you know in a lot of cases you got to do the face to face, but uh, I think that if they're in touch with their healthcare provider on a regular basis, uh, you know even for for dietary reasons, uh, well, that's so very important as well. You know, thank you for your ongoing support to the nation's veterans. Something that's that's critical. Uh, what can you tell us about the VA hospitals and how they've been handling COVID-19 care? Well, they've done a good job in my area. I will tell you that, and we do talk to the secretary of the VA frequently. But it, our veterans are getting a little restless because they want to go to their outpatient clinics uh, instead of traveling 
to a hospital. And the telehealth is working. We get a lot of re- reviews on the on the telehealth, but uh, they prefer to see their their patient, their their doctor, in a lot of cases uh, at their local outpatient clinic because it's much closer, much more convenient. It's it's kind of like a neighbor neighborhood uh, clinic, and uh, and uh, you know they they feel like they're part of it, and uh, we have to take care of our veterans. That's been my number one priority. That's excellent. Uh, really appreciate that again. And you know, one of the things we were able to catch up with a little bit is, is you talked about your family and uh, how you all interact and the importance of family and some of your, um, how you celebrate. But what have you learned from your own family about healthy aging and, and how do you Healthy aging, healthy? well, you know, again, being around your grandparents uh, for, for years, there's nothing better than getting exposing your children to uh, to the previous generation. I grew up in a small community, a small Greek community, as a matter of fact, in Florida, and uh, it, it was a, it prepared me for life, and it also prepared me for Congress specifically uh, to help out our elderly. That's excellent, and. Um... You know, I think a lot of your experiences we all can relate to with uh, uh, our families aging, with with exposing uh, our uh, children and, and young family members to them to to learn, as you as you mentioned, and and to just witness, uh, learn from them, and learn and witness uh, the process and and uh, the camaraderie and help that comes along with family and and uh, and it's important. To and them. you know, it's some of our process. grandparents, in my case, my grandparents were immigrants, and they appreciate this country so much uh, because they saw what it was like on the other side. They didn't have opportunities uh, in their home countries. So they came over here for opportunities for themselves, but more importantly for their children and grandchildren. So, you know, again, that's the American dream. That's the American story. And uh, we're very fortunate to live in this great country. And and speaking to our grandparents about these issues uh, and our parents, uh, it makes us more proud to be Americans. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Deshaun Dorsey. Deshaun is Vice President of the Payment and Healthcare Delivery Department at the Advanced Medical Technology Association, which most people know as AdvoMed. Her work includes policy development and analysis of regulatory issues affecting the medical technology industry, reimbursement for ambulatory surgical centers, advanced wound healing and tissue regeneration, coding, and physician payment issues. She also leads the organization's work around racial health disparities. Prior to joining AdvoMed, Deshaun was the Director of Health Policy for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And before that, she was a Senior Counsel with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Counsel to the Inspector General, where she worked as a litigator on a variety of fraud and abuse issues. AdvoMed is kindly supporting the Silver Innovative Award. So please join me in welcoming Deshaun. Hi, everyone. I'm Deshaun Dorsey with AdvoMed, and I'm honored to join you this afternoon to present the 2020 Alliance for Aging Research Silver Innovator Award to Dr. Derek DeWitt, Chief Finance Officer and Director of the Maryland Baptist Aged Home. The Silver Innovator Award is given each year to an individual who shows exceptional dedication to anticipating, embracing, and addressing the unique and ever-evolving needs of older adults. This year's award honors Dr. DeWitt for his tireless work on behalf of older adults. You may have heard of the Maryland Baptist Aged Home. Not only is it the oldest African-American owned and operated nursing home in the state of Maryland, It has also received national praise for having zero COVID-19 diagnoses. Considering the national affection rates, especially among older adults in long-term care settings, and even more so among older adults of color, this is a feat that must be recognized and celebrated. Dr. DeWitt has long served as a model for people-centered, compassionate, 
and evidence-based long-term care. His extraordinary compassion and care for others extends far past his work as director and CFO of Maryland Baptist Aged Home. His humanitarian efforts greatly impact his hometown of Baltimore City and extend abroad to Africa, where he and his wife support orphanages in Kenya and Uganda. His church operates model food programs, a weekly soup kitchen, free summer camps for youth, a weekly addiction ministry, affordable housing, and much more. Dr. DeWitt, thanks to you and the staff at the Maryland Baptist Aged Home for keeping your residents safe and well and serving as such a remarkable example. It's wonderful to be with you today and to present you with the Alliance's Silver Innovator Award. Congratulations. Thank you, Deshaun. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you for speaking with me today. And I just wanna uh, say hello to the Alliance for Aging Research and to the guests who have come together to celebrate the important work that you do on the behalf of the nation's older adults and all Americans and to the president and CEO, uh, Ms. Sue Pynchon, uh, to the staff and the board of directors, thank you for honoring and choosing me for the Silver Innovator Award. I'm humbled by this award. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. DeWitt. And Dr. DeWitt, I would just like to ask you a few questions regarding the work you're being recognized for. So let's get started. More than 40% of COVID-19 deaths have occurred in nursing homes. But as director and CFO of the Maryland Baptist Aged Home in Baltimore, you and your colleagues played a key role in preventing COVID-19 from entering the facility. And there have been zero cases of COVID-19 at the Maryland Baptist Aged Home. What actions were taken to make this possible? Well, certainly a lot and all of the credit has to go to our tremendous staff and our uh, medical uh, team. But the, the main things we did, we acted early and we acted aggressively. And when I say early, um, our facility was um, uh, shut down to visitors by about February 28th. So um, that was real early. And then we were very aggressive in our, um, in, in our uh, preparation in that we had a very stringent uh, quality control measures and invention control measures in place already. But we didn't allow anybody who did not have to have direct contact with the uh, residents to come in the facility. And we didn't allow the residents to go out of the facility unless it was an extreme emergency. So um, just acting early, acting aggressively, and being, um, I would say, overly excessive as it related to the screening of our employees when they come to work and just making sure that everybody had uh, sufficient PPE stockpiled early before the shortages came. So those types of uh, things helped us to uh, accomplish where we are today. Well, very good. And the Maryland Baptist Aged Home is one of the oldest Black-owned nursing homes in Maryland. What are your thoughts on, on COVID-19 disproportionately impacting Black communities? And what actions can we take to help reduce this racial disparity? Well, of course, you know, we understanding that, that there was racial disparities, especially in healthcare and housing and education and employment. Um, but mainly in, in healthcare and even with older Americans. Um, and then we know that uh, comorbidities affect uh, people of color, uh, you know, at a disproportionate rate. So we had to prepare ourselves for that. We had to understand that um, there was going to be some, uh, a certain amount of self-reliance that we were going to have to engage in to make sure that our residents were cared for and even though we followed the guidelines of the, of the medical experts, we made sure that we uh, were at least looking out for ourselves because we weren't sure when help was gonna come and if we were gonna get help. And we knew that if COVID-19 got into our facility, it would be devastating. But in order for us to, um, to uh, combat some of these disparities, there's gonna have to be real conversation with people of power who will face the biases that they have and that we all have and and make sure that the um uh, the services that 
uh, people in, in uh, communities of color are available and affordable. But the first thing we have to do is be uh, willing to have real dialogue on the subject. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. DeWitt, for that. Dr. DeWitt, in your opinion, what are the most pressing issues older adults face today that must be resolved? Well, again, we come back to the disparities in healthcare, um, affordability and access uh, within certain communities. And then um, I think we have to work hard to keep um, our seniors healthy in the beginning. A lot of the programs that we see uh, through our government are designed to help seniors after they have already uh, encountered some uh, problem, some health problem or or a physical problem, uh, but we need to, I think, uh, invest more in making sure that our seniors stay healthy um, before they encounter the problems. Absolutely, and one last question for you, Dr. DeWitt. What have you learned from your own family about healthy aging, and how do you practice healthy aging? Well, I've, I've been blessed to have uh, both of my, uh, my grandparents in my life. My, my, my grandmother on my father's side, uh, she lived to be 98. My grandmother on my mother's side, she's still living. She's 93 and very healthy. And um, so um, um, she never even had a doctor until the Affordable Care Act mandated it. So um, I've learned from them that you have to, one, stay very active. Um, which is, I think is important for our seniors to keep them active, keep their bodies active, keep their minds active, and to then everything in moderation. As grandma always said, um, it, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And um, if you have uh, um, uh, things that you do that will abuse your body, you'll end up paying for it in the end. So just stay active and do everything in moderation. And um, and I think my grandmother's one of the successes that they always taught me is uh, to always keep God first. And that will also help you to have a long and healthy life. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. DeWitt. And thank you so much for your time and for your incredible work. And congratulations again on this much deserved award. Great talking with you. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. God bless. Now we have a very special message from our 2020 Excellence in Leadership for Older Adults Award honoree, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. Governor Hogan has been open about his own personal experience as a patient navigating his cancer treatment and raising awareness of the importance of supporting medical research. Professionally speaking, Governor Hogan wears many hats, including one as the chairman of the nonpartisan National Governors Association which represents all 55 U.S. states, territories, and commonwealths. On the state level, his commitment to Maryland and its residents hasn't gone unnoticed. During his November 2018 re-election, he received the most votes of any Maryland gubernatorial candidate, and he fights on behalf of the Maryland's oldest residents. In fact, Maryland is the first state in the country to start a free opt-in telephonic service to check on Maryland's older residents across the entire state. In response to the unprecedented COVID-19 global pandemic, Governor Hogan took some of the earliest and most aggressive actions in the nation to prioritize the health and safety of Maryland residents. Under Governor Hogan's leadership, hospital surge capacity was expanded in record time. Testing capacity was exponentially increased. Millions of units of personal protective equipment were acquired and a robust contact tracing operation was launched in order to find and fight the virus. Well, if this work as governor wasn't enough to keep him busy, the NGA chairman, the governor led more than 50 calls with the nation's governors, the president and or vice president and members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Under Governor Hogan's leadership, the NGA successfully pushed for funding to support the National Guard's COVID-19 response missions, convinced the federal administration to invoke the Defense Production Act to produce ventilators and swabs, and achieve greater flexibility in federal CARES Act funding. Governor Hogan, 
thank you for everything you've done and for all that you continue to do for your state and for our country. I'm Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, and I'm so honored to join the Alliance for Aging Research today. I want to sincerely thank President and CEO Sue Peshin, your staff, the Board of Directors, for this very special award for excellence in leadership for older adult health. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every facet of our lives, from the way we work, travel, and communicate with our loved ones, to the way we hold events, just like this one. This is especially true for older Americans. After the tremendous actions we've taken and all the incredible progress we've made, it is more critical than ever that we remain vigilant and continue taking the steps that we know will help stop the spread. Our administration remains fully committed to safeguarding the health and well-being of Marylanders of all ages. And though we may not know what the weeks and months ahead have in store, I do know that we will do what Americans have always done in times of crisis. We will get through this together and we will come back stronger and better than ever before. Thank you again and may God bless each and every one of you. Our next presenter is the founder for the Alliance for Aging Research, Alliance board member, and my close personal friend, Daniel Perry. Now, because of Zoom etiquette rules, I'm not at liberty to share some of the stories about Dan Perry. But what I can say is that Dan founded the Alliance for Aging Research in Washington, D.C., 1986. The Alliance soon became the leading U.S. citizen advocacy organization for promoting a very broad agenda of medical and scientific research to improve the health and independence of older Americans. Dan retired in 2015, but fortunately, he now serves the Alliance as both founder and a member of the board of directors. In 2016, this award was named for the Daniel Perry Founders Award in honor of Dan's invaluable contribution to aging research. I have to say that Dan is one of the most visionary, charismatic, and impressive persons I know. And I'm proud to say that the most important thing to me is that I can call him my friend. So Dan, I proudly turn it over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Perry, founder of the Alliance for Aging Research. Today I am speaking with Dr. Jack Goralnik of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, where he is currently professor of epidemiology and public health. Jack also serves as chair of the Science Advisory Board of the Alliance's Aging in Motion, or AIM. That's an initiative of the Alliance to focus on sarcopenia and related loss of physical function with aging. Jack is one of the world's leadest, leading epidemiologists studying age-related changes in physical functioning and disability. I'm gratified to present Jack with the Founders Award of the Alliance. This is our recognition of an individual who is helping to change the paradigm for how we view aging and healthy aging as we grow older. Dr. Goralnik spent 25 years in epidemiology research at the National Institute on Aging. And he was chief of the intramural division of epidemiology, demography, and biometry. Throughout his career, Jack has continued to receive numerous awards and citations, uh, recognizing the significance of his contributions to science and health. These honors reflect the tremendous respect in which he is held both by industry leaders, government, and his scientific peers. Jack and I have known each other for more than 30 years. In fact, one of the most significant efforts of the Alliance was to highlight an original study by Jack and by Dr. Ed Schneider, a former deputy director of the National Institute on Aging that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1990. They analyzed available data 
and forecast startling increases in future healthcare costs due to the rapid aging of our population. More importantly, the Guralnik and Schneider team spoke out against efforts to ration healthcare services against the elderly and instead called for a huge new increase in biomedical research funding aimed at preventing and ameliorating age-related chronic disabilities. The Alliance orchestrated a press conference in the U.S. Capitol to draw attention to the U.S. policy implications of their important new research. Jack was a key speaker, along with prominent members of Congress, physicians, and a former cabinet secretary for health, Joseph Califano. The paper was later published in, and, and cited in over 1,000 scholarly journals around the world, and even more in the mainstream media. The Alliance continues to fight against healthcare rationing that, that, that uh, disadvantages older Americans. One example is our recent work in continuing to oppose very strongly discriminatory practices of the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, or ICER. Jack, please share with our guests, what is sarcopenia, and why is it so important for the mobility and well-being of people as they grow older? Well, Dan, thank you for that introduction. It really is a great honor to receive this award. The word sarcopenia comes from the Greek roots, sarx, which means flesh, and penia, which means poverty. So it's reduction in muscle mass uh, that we see with aging. Now, we start losing muscle mass in our 30s, believe it or not, uh, slowly but surely. Uh, this loss of muscle accelerates. In some people, it accelerates a great deal, and uh, that can result from specific chronic diseases like heart failure, diabetes, others, uh, but also some people uh, lose muscle mass for, for, for no apparent reason. And while we all are losing muscle as we age, uh, for those who lose it more uh, quickly, uh, it can have really profound effects on the ability to function independently. Uh, everything from simply opening a jar uh, to climbing a, a, a set of steps uh, is very much influenced by, by how much muscle we have. One of the themes of uh, our program this year, Heroes in Health, uh, is strength. And that was chosen in large part uh, to reflect your important work to help reduce the impact of physical frailty on older people. What role does strength play in healthy aging? And what advice can you give people who are listening to uh, our discussion to help them stay stronger as they grow older? Yeah, these are lots of very, very good questions. Uh, first of all, I was just talking about muscle mass. Uh, the relationship between muscle mass and strength, of course, is very important. Um, most of our strength decline comes from, from losing muscle, but there are other things that influence uh, strength as well. We, we need to uh, innervate the, the, the muscles with the peripheral nerves to stimulate them to contract. You need to, you need to, de to deliver oxygen and nutrients to muscles. The uh, biology of muscles has to work in a way that you get good, strong contraction. So while mass is important, there are other things going on. It becomes a, a more uh, complicated and more interesting issue of, of what affects strength. Maintaining strength, as, as you mentioned, is a, a really important factor in maintaining healthy aging. Now, it's pretty obvious uh, what I'm going to say about how to stay strong, and that's what we hear over and over again. We have to keep exercising. We have to keep active. The, the simple approach does not have to use fancy equipment in a gym. You can use small weights that you have at home. Uh, elastic bands are used in various uh, strength training programs. And even simple things like rising from a chair, uh, and, and walking will contribute to strength. That's great advice. And I know you have really laid down the strong scientific foundations underneath a lot of those recommendations that are now 
reflected by the NIA and others. But let's let our, our viewers and listeners know a little bit more about you. What sparked your interest uh, early on in pursuing a career in science and research? Well, I started out as a practicing physician and I did a lot of work in, in public health, uh, decided to go back to public health school. I was working in California at the time and went back to the public health school at the University of California at Berkeley um, and studied epidemiology. I went back for a master's in public health. I got that degree and I just really loved epidemiology. I found it fascinating. I found it a way of asking and answering a lot of important questions um, and decided to stay on and, and get a PhD in epidemiology uh, before coming to the NIA, where, I, as you say, I spent many years. What words of wisdom do you have for a young person who is looking at various fields and, and possibly considering that of aging research and, and even physical frailty? What would you say? In giving advice to young people who are thinking about going into research in general, it's, it's a difficult uh, path. Uh, it's very challenging, but it can be incredibly satisfying. So if, if you feel like you're cut out for, for research, um, if you have that kind of innate fascination with, with science and with trying to learn things that no one has ever learned before, uh, research can, can just be uh, satisfying and a lot of fun. I would say that people um, need to find a mentor or a group that they really love working with so that they, they have a, a good working situation with a lot of support. Uh, should work to develop collaborations. People in research should, should be generous. We collect a lot of data in our work and some people kind of keep that data so close at hand that they never share it. Well, I find that, that, that sharing and being generous with what you have always comes back around to help you in the future. And then be strategic in your choices of, of where to go with your research. And this also involves using the people you've developed as a network and the people you work with to help you make really good decisions. And we hope that for a good portion of these younger people starting out, that a decision might be made to go into aging research. And um, for those who are thinking about it, we can now point to just some really exciting examples of where research that ranges from uh, basic biology of aging all the way through clinical care um, and um, uh, financial issues related to providing care. Um, that whole range of, of research has, has really increased in its quality. And so that there, there are a lot of um, footsteps to follow and a lot of good people to work with. Uh, so I would tell younger people that are thinking about aging that, that this is a really um, great place to, to put your efforts in, in research. Well, the older Americans of this country, thank you for that. And those that aspire to someday be old and to be healthy and active. Jack, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for uh, this dialogue, for the choices you've made in your career, for the contributions that you've made. And congratulations again on this most deserving and timely award. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dan. And I am so pleased that this award is named after you. Uh, it, it really uh, is a great honor for me. Thank you, Jack. Our next presenter is Calvin Schmidt who serves as a senior vice president and worldwide leader of Johnson & Johnson's Government Affairs and Policy Group. Calvin is an accomplished business leader with nearly three decades of global experience developing innovative solutions for patients, providers, and healthcare systems that help people live healthier and longer lives. Calvin has built a reputation as an inspirational leader across a broad range of segments within j, j since he joined the company in 2005. What is particularly impressive about Calvin is his management style. For, for him, it is all about being rooted in diversity and inclusion, and he has a deep appreciation for innovation that's driven by the collaboration of people from many cultures, backgrounds, and experiences. Calvin's commitment to improving health and healthcare goes well beyond his day-to-day -day work. He was appointed to the Foundation of Overseas for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, 
He also represents J&J on the Healthcare Leadership Council. And last year, we were fortunate to have Calvin join the board of directors for the Alliance for Aging Research. We sincerely thank Johnson & Johnson for kindly supporting this year's Perennial Hero Award. So let's all welcome Calvin Schmidt. Hello everybody, my name is Calvin Schmidt and I am thrilled to present this year's Perennial Hero Award. Uh, it was created to honor older individuals who are actively contributing to create positive societal change and serve as role models for people of all ages. Dr. Laura Karstensen, the founder and director of the Stanford Center on Longevity, wrote about this term in the Washington Post saying, the symbolism it connotes is perfect. For one, perennials make clear that we're still here, blossoming again and again, and it also suggests a new model of life in which people engage and take breaks, making new starts repeatedly. Perennials aren't guaranteed to blossom year after year, but given the proper conditions, good soil, nutrients, the love they need, they can go on for decades. You know, for me, it is really, really aspirational. So I'm thrilled to present this year's Perennial Hero Award to Jerry and Jim, Jerry and Jim Taylor, that is, for their inspiring second careers as advocates for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the research in this area, care and support for people with the disease and families as caregivers. Jerry was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2012. And since that time, the couple have spoken to over 10,000 people around the United States and in Europe in order to educate others about the disease. They've not only reduced the stigma, encouraged participation in Alzheimer's clinical trials, but the New York Times published an acclaimed 12-page article, Fraying at the Edges, as a special section of the paper on May 1st, 2016, about Jerry's journey with Alzheimer's disease. In addition to their speaking engagements and other educational efforts, Jerry and Jim are actively engaged in several national Alzheimer's projects, serving on executive steering committees and FDA panels to review drugs and devices representing the needs and perspective of patients and family caregivers. They have also been a supportive, very supportive of the Alliance's Talk Nerdy to Me program as students, teachers, and now ambassadors. One of my favorite programs that the Alliance offers. Their most recent project is co-founding Memory Advocates Program, known as MAP. It's a peer-to-peer -peer support organization to assist newly diagnosed individuals who have cognitive issues and their care partners. Trained volunteers will bring emotional support, information regarding online resources about the disease, information about local support services, and assist clients in finding a clinical trial if the clients are interested. A New York City pilot partnering with New York City's Caring Kind and NYU Medical School neurologists will hopefully begin as early as next year. Jerry and Jim, it is so wonderful to be with you today and to present the Perennial Hero Award to both of you. Big, big, big congratulations. You know, you both went through the Alliance's Talk Nerdy to Me training first as participants and then as expert speakers, you know, what did you learn from the training? You know, how has it helped you as patient advocates? Calvin, first let me express our gratitude to the Alliance for this award. We really feel deeply touched and honored that uh, given the outstanding work we know that the Alliance does, that to be considered and to be awarded the Perennial Hero Award is it's a high, high watermark for us in our work, so thank you. Recently, Jerry has uh, experienced an increasing challenge over the last two months even in the, the short-term memory and communication so that finding words and expressing herself is a little more difficult than it would have been even a year ago. So I may do more speaking. Believe me, she's perfectly capable of speaking for herself most of the time, but uh, I may end up doing more of uh, the speaking today. Jerry uh, 
has done research in her career. She was a 45-year healthcare professional in New York City, developed programs uh, to keep disabled uh, individuals in their home for as long as possible, and ran a long-term care institutions with a dementia unit. And so she's quite experienced and knowledgeable, and before that had done research. But for me, it was really uh, the opportunity to learn particularly about the FDA drug development process and the uh, safety requirements that accompany the development of drugs and devices to advance uh, cures for and disease-modifying treatments for Alzheimer's was very, very important. But actually, the main thing I took away, Calvin, was something different. We had two or three, three or four different disease representatives in the room. We were Alzheimer's, and there were several other diseases. But one particular lady uh, had founded a national support organization for chronic pain sufferers eight to 10 years prior. And other chronic disease sufferers in the room uh, gave testimonials to what a tremendous gift she had been to them. And this lady did not have a medical did not have medical or research experience. And you know, I sat there and, and I thought, boy, given what she's done and given the need for that, the people suffering from Alzheimer's, wow, you know, there's no reason, especially with a partner like Jerry who has the medical background and the research experience, there's no reason that she and I couldn't do that. That was a Rubicon for me. If you had to give some advice or some nuggets of wisdom to someone that was newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, what would you say to that person? I think what um, I would say to people is um, don't hide. You are a val valuable human being and you have all of the rights that we all have. And as we go through this path, um, it becomes our path and it becomes our reality. And it is valid and it's appropriate and it's good for the rest of the world as much as anybody. What we try to tell people is that yes, the late stages of dementia and Alzheimer's are difficult you can have many years in which you can live fully and passionately if you decide to manage your disease rather than suffer from it. Jerry's been diagnosed for eight years and those have years have literally been enriched by knowing that she has Alzheimer's disease because we live more purposefully and more passionately. So we, we try to encourage individuals to learn how to manage Alzheimer's. And we think there are four steps that are, are very important in that. And first, educate yourself about the disease. Understand what the stages are, what the accompanying symptoms are, because knowledge is power and relieves anxiety as the mind begins to change. Secondly, uh, something that Jerry has been outstanding at is developing what we call living strategies. In other words, as your mind becomes a little slower or more forgetful, develop the techniques that allow you to compensate for that declining memory. The third thing is develop a passion for life. Find something you love to do and do it passionately. And then finally, uh, is to consider joining research in an Alzheimer's drug trial. Today, less than 1% of Americans with Alzheimer's Less than 1% participate in clinical drug trials. And I think this is a crisis because we are dramatically slowing the opportunity to find a cure and or a disease-modifying treatment. So we strongly encourage people to consider joining trials. Very, very clear. You know, Jim, as a, you know, as a caregiver and partner, anything else from your perspective that you would give advice to others on on you know, facing what you're experiencing on a daily basis? I would encourage care partners to acknowledge that they have 
uh, an accompanying emotional set that needs to be addressed and, and honored uh, over some amount of time. But you can't let that grief continue. The stages of grief are well known and uh, take care of those, nurse those, but then pull out and realize that you've also been given an opportunity, a very great opportunity to grow and enlarge yourself as a person. One is to realize how important your attitude and positive outlook is for the person you're taking care of. Two, it's developing patience. Also, one of the things that Jerry has taught me is not to be what I call a helicopter uh, care partner. It's like a helicopter parent who does too much for their children. Every time I do something with the best of intentions, Calvin, that Jerry can do for herself, it takes away her self-regard, her dignity, her self-esteem. And so many care partners with the best of intention end up helping their their partner stay on the couch, as opposed to helping them do the things that they can do and even new things, which is much more exhilarating for them than helping them to decline. The word that comes to my mind is uh, inspiring. I can feel your, um, uh, your love and caring about others in a selfless way, and then also the challenges that you're faced with, um, the insights that you've shared, it just, you know, for everybody listening uh, and watching today, you can see why uh, Jerry and Jim, you are so well deserved of this um, of this award. Um, I'm humbled to be able to uh, present this to you. Big, big, big congratulations uh, to to you both and your many future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations again to Jerry and Jim Taylor. Now, next up, we have a special treat from the Alliance for Aging Research, Anthony Fauci Fan Club. Now, please join Sue Peschen, Brad Rhodes, and Brent Shuttleworth as they perform this special tribute for Dr. Fauci. Oh, 
information and honesty. The champion of science for public health, legendary. We have your back, Dr. Fauci. Wasn't that outstanding? Those lyrics were fantastic and so creative. Our next and final award is new for 2020. The Champion of Science Award is presented to an individual who has demonstrated courage and integrity in the pursuit of science that protects the lives of older adults and all Americans. And our honoree really doesn't need much of an introduction since he is a household name. Dr. Anthony Fauci has served as the director of the NIH National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. He oversees research to prevent, diagnose, and treat established infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS, respiratory infections, diarrhea diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, as well as emerging diseases such as Ebola, Zika, and lately the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Fauci has worked tirelessly to convey honest public health messaging to the American public. In the midst of the pandemic, he has tried to create a much needed sense of trust that has given comfort to a lot of people through very challenging times. As advocates for the health of older adults, the Alliance is truly grateful for his courage and his steadiness. Dr. Fauci and his team have also worked around the clock for COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. The collaboration happening at the NIH between the public and private sector on this is more important now than ever. Dr. Fauci, on behalf of the Alliance and all Americans, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to join all of you today in this virtual celebration event. I'm also humbled and deeply grateful to receive the Champion of Science Award, and I want to begin by expressing my appreciation to the Alliance for Aging Research and its president, Sue Payson, for this honor. As we continue to contend with the COVID-19 pandemic that has upended our lives, I'm heartened by the profound courage demonstrated by so many ordinary Americans during this challenging time. From the scientists working around the clock to develop COVID-19 treatments and vaccines, to the frontline emergency and healthcare workers risking their lives to save others, to the essential workers who show up every day to provide food and other services, to the families abiding by local public health guidelines as they struggle to juggle work, teaching, and full-time care at home. All of us are being tasked in one way or another to dig deep and be strong, resourceful, compassionate, and resilient. And so, while I am honored that the Alliance for Aging Research selected me, I ask us to honor all the everyday American heroes who also have shown courage and integrity during this public health crisis. As a proud member of the Alliance's intended population, I am 79 years old, I applaud your attention to older adults and healthy aging. Your focus has always been critically important, but it is especially vital now during this pandemic where older individuals and especially those with certain pre-existing health conditions are at increased risk of serious COVID-19 outcomes. Your promotion of evidence-based information provides both practical guidance and comfort in anxious times and you and many other health advocacy groups have risen to the occasion to provide that. Our country's journey back to some sort of normality will be neither fast nor easy, and uncertainties lie ahead, especially this fall, when seasonal flu and pneumonia may complicate our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I urge everyone to get their flu shot and, as appropriate, to talk to your doctor about whether you need the pneumonia vaccine. By adhering to recommended vaccinations, we not only protect ourselves, we also protect others, especially the most vulnerable. To successfully protect all Americans from familiar as well as newly emerging infectious diseases, 
we must overcome vaccine hesitancy and ensure that all people have access to safe and effective preventive vaccines. Thankfully, the Alliance for Aging Research has an impeccably strong network of partners because we are all in this together. And together we must vigorously defend the value of proven vaccines for public health and promote accurate science-based information about them. And so, please wear a face covering, wash your hands often, and keep a safe distance, but stay connected and hopeful too. Your individual courage is essential to surmount the daily challenges this pandemic poses. But essential too is your courage to be a champion of science. Science is the pathway to the tools that will one day enable us to see COVID-19 in the rearview mirror. Thanks again to the Alliance for Aging Research for this award. I am deeply grateful and pleased to be your partner in healthy aging and please everyone stay well. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for your insightful and inspiring words. Well, we've come to the end of the program. We want to thank you for joining us at the Virtual Heroes in Health Annual Celebration, and more importantly, for celebrating and supporting the Alliance for Aging Research. Congratulations again to our 2020 honorees. We do have to give a special thanks to our official media sponsor, Berman & Company, for their help in making today's virtual program possible. Congratulations to the Alliance for its ongoing work to improve the universal health experience of aging and health. But let's also congratulate someone else, someone who doesn't ask for it, but truly deserves it. And that's Sue Peshin for her leadership, her advocacy, and most importantly, her effectiveness of pushing the scientific breakthroughs on behalf of seniors and all patients. So Sue, our hearts go out to you and deep with deep appreciation. We do want to tell you this, to learn more about the Alliance projects, visit our booths in the exhibit hall or online at www.agingresearch.org. So as we conclude, thank you again for joining us. Please stay safe, healthy, and be well.